Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Steve McMenamin. I'd like to welcome you to the Founders Council, which is part of the ongoing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. As you may know, the Founders Council is our evening session of the Greenwich Roundtable. This is where we are uh, not in the morning. We're talking about issues here, not of wealth creation, but of process and ethics. Uh, this was started about eight years ago. Tonight, our topic is due diligence in alternative investments, all strategies. And um, I'd like to welcome you here. This time, we are a little bit more social, a little bit more relaxed. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Ben Alamansky, who's our moderator this evening. Ben has served. Now, this will be his third best practices study. Uh, ben uh, initially formed the um, or led the group that did Global Macro and CTA. And uh, Ben is the chief investment officer, or at least the uh, person who is in charge of all hedge fund investments for the Glenmead Trust in Philadelphia. And without further ado, uh, Ben, would you kick it off? Kick it off. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Um, let, me, uh, <clears throat> let me just start off. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to uh, go through everyone's bios because I think it's very important we spend a little bit of time to understand the background of, of, of Everyone to my uh, my left, um, and then uh, and then we're going to start with Aaron, and we'll you know we'll go through and we'll ask some questions throughout, and then we'll open it up. Um, so to start off with, Erin um, uh, Erland uh, uh, began her career as a reporter at Dow Jones Newswires in, in 1993. Uh, in 1996, moved to Moscow to write about business and emerging markets at the English uh, language daily newspaper, the Moscow Times. In uh, 1998, she joined the street.com, uh, and, um, and then she moved to Barron's to cover options, mutual funds, and hedge funds from 2000 to 2003, uh, and then moved on uh, to report on business and politics in the former Soviet Union for the New York Times in 2003 uh, for a few years. She has Wall Street experience and, and uh, worked uh, uh, at uh, Stanford Bernstein um, in the private client division. Um, and uh, like me, divides her time between uh, New York and Philadelphia. Um, then we have Jim Roth, um, and uh, Jim's background, um, Jim is the, uh, is the founder and the CEO of the Langley Group uh, and a former senior CIA officer who served in a variety of international assignments in the Middle East, Europe, South Pacific, and Washington, D.C. Um, and during uh, his 15-year career at the CIA's clandestine service, he led intelligence operations aimed at monitoring significant political and military developments worldwide uh, in support of U.S. national security policy objectives. Um, upon leaving the, uh, the CIA, um, uh, Jim developed sophisticated proprietary techniques adapted from, uh, from his intelligence collection model, the CIA's intelligence collection model, <clears throat> to carry out due diligence and in intelligence collection in support of, uh, of, of investment decision making. And he founded the Langley Group in 2007 and has worked with, uh, with many of the world's most prominent hedge funds, uh, investment banks, and private equity firms. Um, uh, Rusty Olson, um, uh, to Jim's left was uh, the former head of the Kodak Pension Fund, which is one of the most successful corporate pension funds, uh, corporate pension funds in the U.S. And uh, very important to tonight's discussion, uh, Rusty was the essentially the editor in chief of this latest best practices uh, piece. Um, and then to uh, to Rusty's left, uh, Jules uh, Kroll um, <coughs> is uh, is principal and co-founder of K2 Global Partners LLC, and which is based in New York and uh, is chairman and CEO of K2's newest venture, which is called Kroll Bond Ratings Incorporated. And I think we're going to hear about that in a few minutes. Uh, Joel uh, is founder of Kroll Inc., um, which is acknowledged founder uh, of modern investigations, intelligence, and, uh, and security industry. In 1972, he established Kroll Associates as a consultant to corporate purchasing departments, and in doing so created the prototype for a new breed of professional services, um, uh, a, new, a new breed of professional services firm dedicated to mitigating risk. Uh, and ultimately, uh, that firm reached an annual revenue uh, a base of a billion dollars in 2008. Um, one thing that's interesting about uh, Jules and, and his firm in the background is that in the early 1990s, uh, Mr. Cole <coughs> gained worldwide renown for the firm's success, uh, successes in searching for assets hidden by Jean-Claude uh, Duvalier, uh, Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos, and Saddam Hussein. Uh, and in July of 2004, uh, Kroll was acquired by Marsh and McLennan Companies. Um, so with that, uh, what I'd like to do is, is turn the discussion over to Aaron and uh, go from there. Hi, everyone. 
Um, my name's Erin Arvidlund. I'm uh, a uh, freelance writer now for Barron's, and um, I just want to thank you guys for having me, especially Steve McMenamin. My presentation is not so much a presentation. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, how I came to write a story for Barron's in 2001, basically raising the question of how Bernie Madoff was able to achieve these incredibly consistent returns. I didn't out him. I didn't expose him. Um, but I did raise what I thought at the time were incredibly nagging questions um, about a hedge fund that everybody wanted to be in. And I'm sure there are, there are lots of you who've been in a similar situation where you've had a hunch about something and um, everyone thinks you're crazy. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, in May of, uh, in April, I'm sorry, of 2001, I got a phone call from a very good source of mine. Um, at the time, he didn't want to be in the story. He wanted to remain nameless, but um, he's in the book today, which is called Too Good to Be True, The Rise and Fall of Bernie Madoff. And um, he was an equity derivative strategist at Deutsche Bank. Um, he's in the book today. His name is Ken Nakayama. And Ken was a very good source of mine who um, had traded options since he'd been at University of Pennsylvania. This guy lived and breathed derivatives. He was, as I affectionately call him, a turbo nerd. <clears throat> and Ken gave me a call uh, one day and said, appealing to my ego, and he said, I have a hedge fund you should write about. It never loses money. And I thought, well, this is it. I've won the Pulitzer. Um, so Ken agreed to um, round up some marketing materials. And since you guys are a very sophisticated audience, I'm just going to use a lot of shorthand lingo here. But um, anyway, Ken had his own selfish reasons for uh, being interested in this hedge fund because it traded uh, OEX options. Um, S&P 100 index options and was returning anywhere from 10 to 12 percent annually and had volatility approaching zero. And he said, I cannot figure out how this guy does it. But really what he wanted to do was reverse engineer the trade because he thought maybe he could do the same thing. Um, either that or he wanted to turn this guy into a customer. So Ken agreed to round up some marketing materials from some of the fund of funds, um, the feeder funds that were really the dominant money raisers or avenues into this spectacular hedge fund. The reason that I chose um, to pursue the story was, you know, back in 2001, hedge funds were not as mainstream really as they are today. I mean, we read about them all the time, but you know, back in 01, they were still, you know, you could probably count on two hands the number of funds over several billion dollars in assets. And the fund that Ken Nakayama called me about was rumored to be running anywhere from six to ten billion in assets, which seemed incredible because OEX options were a dying instrument. Um, as I'm sure all of you remember, you know, people weren't trading the S&P 100 index. They were trading the NASDAQ. They were trading anything else. Um, the OEX pit in the Chicago Board Options Exchange was dead, really, almost. And um, so it seemed incredible that somebody could be generating these kinds of returns. So that was the first red flag, if you will. The second red flag was the very unusual fee arrangement. Um, again, since you are all familiar with this, um, basically the 2 and 20 arrangement that most 2 and 15, 2 and 20, whatever it is today, um, the arrangement that Bernie Madoff had with his marketers, um, which the, there were three main ones. Um, Fairfield Greenwich, Tremont, and Kinggate, 
based out of London. And they were raising money for Madoff um, under a fantastic fee arrangement, which was that normally a hedge fund manager would keep the 2% asset, you know, percent of assets annual fee and the 20% carry. But in the case of Bernie Madoff, he actually let all of the fund of funds keep that 20%. So, for instance, in 2007, just from raising money for Bernie Madoff, the two principals at Fairfield Greenwich each made $45 million just from raising money for Bernie. So, of course, back in 2001, I was um, a total neophyte. I had no idea um, what I was getting into. And um, I thought, well, this is weird. Why would Bernie Madoff give up hundreds of millions of dollars in fees every year to his marketers? This makes no sense. So that was the second red flag. And then there were the investors. Um, There were two camps, basically. Um, there were the people who loved Madoff, the people who raved about him, and the people who were incredibly worried about him. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of other hedge funds out there where people feel the same way. But I talked to several investors who were very happy with Bernie Madoff. They had been with him for decades. They had put their kids through college. Um, they had made their their own investors very happy, particularly in the case of some banks and fund of funds. And then there were the others. Um, there's, there was one source for the story who worked at Merrill Lynch in their um, uh, private client division, and he was terrified of Bernie Madoff. The guy desperately wanted to pull his clients out. But there was a lot of career risk for taking on Bernie Madoff. Um, not only from below, from so to speak, from investors who, you know, if you did pull them out, they'd probably fire you. But then from above, um, as it turned out, the vice chairman of Merrill Lynch, Lonnie Steffens, was an investor. So it put investors, you know, like many of you, I'm sure, um, have faced these situations, it put investors in a very tight spot. Um, to this day, you know, this guy never wanted his name revealed. So that was the, the final red flag. And for weeks, I had been trying to get Bernie Madoff on the phone. And finally, um, I think it was the Wednesday or Thursday before Marin's comes out on Saturday. Um, I put in one more phone call and I said, this is it. The story's running, whether he's going to comment or not. And then, boom, he was made available all of a sudden. And uh, I think he said he was, I was patched through on this very scratchy international phone line because, you know, cell phones back then. And um, so I got to talk to Bernie himself. And so I asked him, you know, what, what's, what's going on with these returns? I mean, they're, they're incredible. Nobody on Wall Street can replicate them. I mean, I had called all my best sources on, you know, the equity derivatives research side of every major, you know, commercial and investment bank, and nobody could replicate it. And moreover, no one had ever done a trade with Bernie Madoff's hedge fund. Uh, they had never done any business with him, which seemed bizarre. Um, and he said, well, it's true that nobody can replicate this strategy because it's proprietary. And, you know, if they're trying to, you know, back out the trade, they're not going to be able to do it. And um, I think he told some other investors, I later found out, he said he traded over the counter or he traded in Europe overnight. Um, and then um, I asked him, well, what about the fact that, you know, that you have this bizarre fee arrangement? You're, you're giving up hundreds of millions of dollars in fees every year. <coughs> and 
And Bernie said, well, that's because, you know, we have this brokerage firm on the side, which, you know, that's what Madoff and his brother Peter were famous for. He said, so we're happy with the trading commissions. Um, and then finally, you know, he had a very strange request, which was that he asked all his investors to basically not reveal that he was their money manager. That was sort of a, uh, a uh, I guess, a, um, what's the right word? A condition um, of staying in the fund. And so he explained that, well, you know, I don't want, basically, I it's a private fund and, you know, People shouldn't be asking crazy questions like this, and don't worry your pretty little head. <laughs> so the story came out on um, in May of 2001. Uh, the following Monday, I came into work thinking, this is it, like, you know, my name in lights. Um, and I didn't get a single phone call. Um, I expected, you know, maybe a lo an angry lawyer or, you know, um, one of Madoff's, I don't know, enforcers or something. And um, by the way, I wasn't the only one who was raising these questions. Um, of course, there was, uh, you know, the whistleblower, Harry Markopoulos, who had been sending in basically warning letters, you know, with these this in incredible... Um, mathematical deductions basically saying it's, you know, impossible, statistically impossible. He'd have to be basically batting 900 to 1,000 to be making these returns every year. So the story came out and seven years went by. Um, I actually left uh, journalism and <coughs> Uh, briefly, in 2005, um, and I went to work in the industry. I worked uh, at a startup, um, and then I worked at Sanford Bernstein in their hedge fund private client division. Um, and in the fall of 2008, it looked very likely that I was going to be laid off. Um, and I had recently gotten married and um, had been moved to Philadelphia from New York and was decided, you know what, some things are more important than the golden handcuffs. So um, in uh, December of 2008, like everyone else, I was watching CNBC on December 11th and um, the headline came over that Bernie Madoff had been arrested. And pardon my French, but I said, holy shit, they finally got him. Um, so we've learned lots of other things um, about, you know, how he was able to get away with the fraud and so forth, which actually was remarkably simple. Um, and, you know, I can certainly take questions about that afterwards. Um, but anyway, the main purpose, um, you know, for, for me speaking here is just to talk about um, kind of asking the dumb questions. Um, I don't know how else to put it. I guess sometimes the questions seem so dumb that you don't even want to say them. Um, but I guess that's why like uneducated people like me come along and sometimes we get lucky. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for uh, listening and I look forward to the Q&A. Erin, let me, let me ask one, one question before we move on. And I was curious. Is there one, are there one or two questions you get? Because you do a lot of speaking and you, yeah. to, you talk to a lot of people, and this is, this is a very, this is one of the most public stories. Is there one thing that you get a lot that is asked over and over again, and what is that? Um, the two questions I get the most are, where did the $65 billion go? <laughs> and, um, you know, which family members in particular, his wife Ruth, uh, helped him, you know, perpetuate this fraud? Um, well, well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to shift the order for a moment. <laughs> okay, so the $65 billion number, um, you know, as we were discussing, is not real, right? Because it includes all the phony profits 
all the, the 10%, and of course I'm terrible at math, so I'm sure someone in this room can uh, work it out that let's say the fraud went on, I believe, anywhere from 30 to 40 years, um, going back probably to the late 60s. So 40 years of phony returns, that gets us probably down to about between 15 and 22 billion. Um, half of that came from the three major fund of funds I mentioned. Um, it also turned out that one, there were some special investors who were getting much more than 10% a year. Um, one of them in particular was Jeffrey Pickauer, who withdrew $20 billion, I think, I'm sorry, $7 billion of the 20, over 20 years, um, which, you know, led investigators to conclude that he probably was, you know, knew very well what was going on. And then, of course, there was Madoff's sons and his brother, his niece, and his wife all working with him. Um, and the only one who's been indicted so far is his brother. And I imagine by the end of the year, perhaps his sons will be charged, but they're going to try and get them on tax evasion as opposed to some criminal, other criminal charge. The tools. <laughs> <clears throat> well, Ben, why have you done this? <laughs> uh, Aaron, nice job. Nice job. Um, I'd like to go back. Uh, Steve, when was the last time you had Jim and I do this stance? It was uh, four years ago. All right. Four years ago. And uh, you said at the time, beware of hedge funds because the incentive to cheat is so great. There will be more. Did I actually say that? Yeah. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> did, did I say anything good? Uh, <laughs> when, you, when you speak. <laughs> Jim, Jim clearly said there had been no weapons of mass destruction <laughs> in, uh, in Iraq, but uh, he, he uh, did quote Warren Buffett in terms of other weapons of mass destruction. Um, first of all, thank you for including including uh, me in this in this discussion so when you're with a group of, of people uh, it's always interesting particularly interesting for me to understand why are they who are they uh, why are they here um, and then uh, why are why are you speaking I mean why are you here uh, I'm here because tonight not too far away, LeBron James <laughs> is going to indicate the why he's not going to the Nets or the Knicks. Undoubtedly, we're not involved in this case. But uh, So I feel in many respects we're at the center of the most important events in the universe. <laughs> Another great sign of a society that really has got its values together. Um, and I think the fact that LeBron has chosen Greenwich as the place to launch with is just it shows it, it, it really it shows so much and, and uh, I, I want to compliment him for his sensitivity and his sort of indirect support of the Greenwich Roundtable because anyone who's got the perseverance of a Steve McMenamin deserves many candles lit for him uh, so uh, more of you selfish bastards should pitch in and keep this group going uh, Some of the selfish bastards did not clap, Steve. <laughs> Why did I say what I said four years ago? Uh, we've been blessed over the last 20, 25 years in my former company that I'm retired from now, which is Kroll Inc., uh, which was sold again two weeks ago. Um, uh, we've, in effect, grew up with the industry, uh, saw the enormous growth, saw the quality of the people, uh, saw the extraordinary uh, business proposition that people have been willing to continue, by and large, to support. I mean, it's reasonably amazing. I think when people write, uh, write the history of, of rewards in relationship to work, this is going to make for an interesting chapter. And I'm not talking about the crooks. Um, I'm talking about the whole business model and how it's been able to be sustained over a pretty long period of time 
now, um, but it's getting harder and harder. So the activities that people will engage in are going to get stranger and stranger. Uh, they'll look different. They'll have a little different wrapping on them. Some of the bows will be different. Some, you know, some of the bows you do a little thing at the end with a scissor and you curl it. And for those of you who had kids and grandchildren, you, you know how hard that is to do. Well, it's getting it's getting harder. It's getting harder. And when people uh, are in a position to make an extraordinarily living from something, um, they get used to that. It, it, it becomes an addiction. Uh, for some, it's Manolo's. Uh, those are shoes. Uh, <laughs> there are a few people here who know what that, that, that is. Um, so the subject, subject is, is due diligence, and what I'd like to do is uh, try to make three points. Number one. I want to once again urge the industry to engage increasingly in self-help. I don't mean self-help in terms of making more money. Uh, that is, I know, an important focus. That's why you're in business. You're in business to make money for your investors and yourself. Um, and, and so I, I am not anyone who's opposed to that. I'm very much in favor of it uh, myself. Uh, but the self-help I'm talking about are the self-help of keeping, doing a better job of keeping the fish tank clean. Because it's the collective intelligence, the networks, the brains in the room, who generally hear the drum beats, uh, can hear the footprints, can smell strange stuff. And we saw it constantly over the years. Uh, in, in many of the investigations we did in, in the hedge fund, in the hedge fund uh, world and other alternative investment situations, everything from uh, Sam Israel, give me a break, Sam Israel. I mean, how many people knew about Sam Israel and what an outright crook and fraud he was? Um, and we were the receiver uh, for Sam for for uh, a Bayou. But before that, we had three separate firms ask us to consider taking a look at them, and the first one said, it's okay. We went in and we, uh, we sent our internal accountants and everything looks good. The second one had a concern and said, it's okay. We've checked with our prime broker. Uh, Goldman just paid $20 million to sort of uh, get the light touch on that one because they didn't know what was going on either, apparently. And the third one, the third one said, we have actually received the personal assurances of Sam. He, he swore to us. He swore to us. There were no issues. So uh, in my book, uh, it was 0 for 3, uh, but they're not alone. And the, the, the Sam Israels of the world, the Bernie Madoffs of the world, and I always pray it's not another Jew. Uh, because I'm Jewish, and uh, so I'm more sensitive to these things. You know, give me, give me a Mulhern once in a while. Give me, give, give me something I can work with. Uh, um, and then I really got it. Well, I will go off on that one. Um, but my point is, nobody can do a better job, if you will, and I just hope more of you have the guts to do it. And I got a big question as to whether you do, or it's all about your own buck. So I ask you to consider that. That's my holier-than-now point. Good. I'll be happy to be questioned on this later. <laughs> my second point is we have a bigger contribution to make, and we can make money along the way. By the way, if you can believe it, I've been asked to serve as an outside director of the Managed Funds Association, the MFA. It's a group you're probably somewhat familiar with. And I said, why in the world would you want me to do this in relationship to your industry? And they said, well, we think you'll have a different point of view. And I said, that's an understatement. Um, and then every time I have a chance to work with the people who are part of the MFA, um, who have done a magnificent job for the industry, because after all, they are a lobbying organization, that's what they do for a living. They've done a pretty good job for an industry in terms of protecting you. But I urge you, stand for something more than the world 
thinks you stand for today. The financial services industry in much of the world is in disrepute today, in case you hadn't noticed. It's got to change. The contribution is enormous. The tens of millions of people who, who count on you, uh, just as Russell did when he was running Kodak's pension fund, they're counting on you. And boy, do they need help. Because these pension funds, many of them are really hurting. They're hurting because they've been overly politicized. They've been hurting because some of the strategies were absurd. They've been, they've been hurt because they put their money in the hands of third-rate people. <clears throat> Uh, they've been hurt because they've been riddled with politics. And then there are some that do just fine. And there's a reason for that. Because they're cleaner. The people are there for reasons other than just making a buck. And we, we as an industry, the hedge fund industry, needs to get out there and give the credit, give the support, do the various things for people who are doing it right. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to put on myself a promotional hat for my third point. This is my effort. I couldn't believe uh, what the role that the rating agencies had played in this. Could not believe it. I came to believe it because having retired, I had a lot of time on my hands. My wife kept shoving me out of the house. I had nothing to do. And so I did what I always try to do. I try to identify a public, uh, a public policy problem that was susceptible of a private sector solution. No new laws, no new changes in regulations, no bureaucratic and political crap, no wasting of billions of dollars with lobbyists and everything else that goes on, even though the MFA has done a great job for you guys. Uh, and I'm an outside director, if you can believe it. But this is about taking one element of the system. God knows they were not, they were not solely to blame for this, but they were the great enablers. So... I'm here to announce that next month, Kroll Bond Ratings is going to issue bond ratings, which is, to some, a fairly frightening concept. <laughs> or as one famous investor said to one of my partners, what the hell does a private detective know about bond ratings? <laughs> I think I know more than the guys that have been doing it all these years. But, it, but uh, of course, the bar is not that high, so it's a reason <laughs> I still am willing to take a shot from, from the uh, three-point circle. And I'm not going back to LeBron anymore uh, tonight. But my point is the better ratings in terms of accuracy, in terms of quality, must rest in part on diligence. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the rating agencies do know diligence. And they tell you. We do no diligence. Or as the man once said, watch my lips. The reason is their great defense has been the First Amendment. They're just, they're protected by the First Amendment because they, they are only expressing an opinion. Interesting. Uh, as a former CEO, I used to go and had my bonds rated, and, and I would go on a Tuesday, and Friday or Monday I have my bond rating. Of course, I always thought I deserved more, but in those cases, they had keen insight and realized I deserved less, actually. <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, we will start issuing ratings in the structured products area before the end of August. But the people doing the work in, in our, my new little venture will be people from the mortgage industry. They know how to talk and think dirty. It's not about putting sausage through models. We'll have models. But we're going to do something else. We're, we're, going to, we're going to take the words of Bill Gross, who uttered them in the last four or five weeks, when he said, whatever happened to judgment? Whatever happened to people looking at what was going on? Uh, when, you know, if you can shove stuff through models and you're still getting the kind of sausages, and those sausages sell for a lot of money, and Moody's was the high, had the highest operating margins for six years running, uh, on the S&P 500, well, that model and that sausage machine looks pretty good. So I think it's going to be time for the introduction, and the rating agencies aren't going to go away, but, but we will have, hopefully, diligence applied to it. You will have, in your various forms and your various strategies, hopefully the kind of quality of analysis and digging 
which is the reason people are willing to pay you what they pay you. So I think we need an application to that business, and I would make a plea, and this is an outright sales pitch commercial plea because I can't help myself. I'm an older person, and it's a Thursday night. Why else would you be here, frankly? Um, or as a friend of mine in the hedge fund industry said to me, he runs a big hedge fund, and I told him what I was doing. And it was, it was last August. It was Joe Flom to my left. Uh, to my right is a, a major figure in American industry, actually a respected figure, uh, who doesn't get paid $50 million for selling, uh, selling bonds. Um, and the guy in the middle is a hedge fund person. And he said to me, don't you have anything better to do with your time? <laughs> so I'm choosing to do this because I think I can do a better job. I think I can do it differently. The model is, in some cases, issuers are paying, but they're not going to be able to game it. In other cases, we're going to have a subscription-based model or, or, a, or a, an investor model, which is a, a short road to making no money. But it's, it's, it's useful in, in, in terms of the mix. But it's all about people in the community looking at what we're doing and many other new ideas and, and putting your money and putting your support by ones where you think the ideas are better because you can make a difference. And the difference begins with looking under the hood, doing the diligence, understanding the facts. And so whether you're listening to Aaron or Markopoulos or Roth or Kroll or Olson, whoever it is, uh, it starts with what's going on here. And then you make your decisions and, and deploy your strategy. So I'm, I'm sort of mentioning it in, in that context. Anyway, thank you for including me. Well, I, I hadn't planned to do this, but I think I'm going to have to, following that, I'm going to have to uh, start with an announcement uh, uh, that the Langley Group is launching a bond rating service. <laughs> uh, we're we're going we're gonna to start tomorrow. Let's let's see if let's see if LeBron can beat t can top that announcement. Um, when uh, when when I was here a, a few years ago, <laughs> thanks, Jules. <laughs> P plus. <laughs> when when, uh, when I was here a few years ago, I spoke in general terms about uh, CIA intelligence collection and uh, how those methods can be adapted for use by investors. And I thought I'd uh, expand on that a, a little bit tonight and, and talk about uh, uh, the role of uh, intelligence in the due diligence process. And uh, But first I wanted to reiterate something that I talked a little bit about last time, and that is uh, the fundamental purpose of intelligence. Uh, in the government, most of the information that policymakers uh, consider as they develop uh, expertise on, on uh, uh, foreign policy and national security issues uh, comes from a combination of, of uh, diplomatic reporting and uh, international media coverage. And, uh, and, and diplomatic reporting, for the most part, consists of accounts of meetings that our uh, diplomats overseas have with their foreign counterparts. And so it follows then that uh, our government's per perceptions are shaped to a great extent by how a, a, you know, each foreign government representative uh, portrays their policies and intentions to our representatives and how we interpret that data. And um, at, the, uh, at the risk of revealing my own personal biases here, uh, I, I'll tell you that in my experience, our uh, State Department diplomats are, are not the most skeptical creatures on the planet. And um, I, I, uh, I remember as a, a young uh, intelligence officer, uh, with, with a full head of hair, by the way, <laughs> I, I hate to brag, but uh, uh, I, I remember sitting in, a, in an embassy uh, country team meeting, and, and these are meetings that take place uh, every week uh, uh, with all of the embassy section heads with the ambassador. And uh, this was the first one of the first time I'd participated in one of these meetings, and it turned out to be one of the most contentious I would ever attend. But I, I, we had a career, we had an ambassador who was a, a political appoint, appointee. Uh, he was a career businessman with no diplomatic experience, and he had been uh, appointed to this post. He, he had been at the post for only a couple of years, and uh, g guys like that don't get a lot of respect from uh, State Department career types. And I sat and watched with uh, some fascination as a, a very uh, irritated ambassador uh, started lecturing this room full of uh, seasoned and uh, very stunned uh, diplomats on the proper way to do their jobs. 
And what he emphasized was that their job was not to, to convince Washington of the virtues of the host government's policies, but rather to convince the foreign governments of the virtue, virtues of U.S. policies. And uh, he told them that uh, if, if they kept that in mind, perhaps they would do a much better job of uh, reporting back to Washington objectively on, a, on the host government's policies and intentions. And at the time, I, I uh, appreciated that, uh, that experience mostly for its entertainment value, but um, over time, uh, I came to realize that, that, that this ambassador, even though he was inexperienced in diplomacy, uh, was a very uh, astute observer of uh, human nature, I think. Uh, he, he'd, he'd figured out in just a couple of months uh, on the job that uh, when, when our diplomats are assigned to new overseas posts, uh, they might go in with the correct mindset, but they'd eventually become uh, enamored with the local culture and with their uh, foreign counterparts. And uh, without realizing it, they, they gradually would lose their objectivity as they interpreted reg regional developments uh, for Washington. And, uh, and, and so their reporting inevitably would, uh, would start to reflect what the host government wanted Washington to think. And, and the end result is that on any given foreign policy or national security issue, uh, a flawed picture starts to emerge, uh, and, uh, which can lead to poor policy decisions uh, if left uncorrected. And that brings me back to, to the issue of, of the purpose of intelligence. And, and I think that fortunately most experienced policymakers recognize that uh, uh, diplomatic and media reporting are, are not only uh, incomplete, but they're also influenced by the biases and the candor of, of, of those whose views are being expressed and interpreted. And, uh, and so they rely on intelligence to fill, fill in gaps, to address uncertainties, to either uh, verify or refute uh, uh, you know, the, the most significant elements of any body of information. And that doesn't mean that, uh, excuse me, uh, and for the most part that, that, uh, that information, uh, that intelligence comes from human sources who, who generally have uh, very little incentive to try to influence our analysis or our policies one way or another. And that doesn't mean that they, they don't have any biases. Uh, they all have biases. It, it, it just means that we have to understand the bias of e each source and factor that in as we triangulate the reporting from, from all sources. And with that type of uh, systematic approach, we, we ought to be able to come to much more accurate conclusions. So in the years that I've been, uh, I've been working with investors, I've seen uh, quite a few parallels between the foreign policy business and, and the investment field. And of course, we've all seen in, uh, instances, and we've, we've talked about some of these tonight, uh, where investors fall in love with companies or, or management teams despite red flags, uh, just like the diplomats who become captivated with uh, the governments and the cultures of the countries that they serve in. And, uh, and similar to, to our diplomats overseas, I think sometimes whose viewpoints are shaped by foreign counterpart, counterparts who seek uh, not just to inform but also to influence uh, investors carrying out due diligence face the challenge of, uh, of making decisions based extensively on the input from uh, subjects of the due, due diligence themselves who are obviously not uh, disinterested observers. And, um, and so I think it's critical to approach due diligence with a healthy dose of uh, skepticism, uh, speaking with a variety of third parties, people, people with no vested interest, and to corroborate uh, key data points and, uh, to complete the picture. And I thought to uh, illustrate uh, the importance of intelligence in, in due diligence that I would uh, describe uh, quickly a project that I was involved with not long ago in the middle of the global financial crisis. And uh, we were evaluating and comparing the risk management practices of about three dozen uh, large and prominent hedge funds, all of which had good track records for, for uh, strong performance and good reputations for uh, emphasizing risk management. And we started by reviewing what had already been generally understood and accepted within the investment community about the risk management operations of, of each fund. And then we used that to form kind of a, a preliminary profile that included things like uh, risk appetite and mindset and commitment of dedicated resources and qualifications and stability of the risk team, and then how, how risk parameters are uh, integrated into the investment process for their uh, various strategies. And uh, the, the, the preliminary profiles were mostly favorable, as you would expect, since all of these hedge funds had good track records, and uh, because uh, we started, the information we started with uh, had largely derived uh, from uh, information that uh, uh, the funds themselves had, had, had revealed about themselves, and, and, and therefore was uh, calculated 
uh, to portray them in the most positive light. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, you, you may have seen a number of these funds uh, um, had, uh, although you know, although they're obviously very secretive normally, uh, had granted interviews with uh, investment publications at that time for the very purpose of touting the robustness of uh, their risk controls, uh, kind of a PR effort, I think, to uh, discourage investors from uh, withdrawing funds during the financial crisis. So anyway, we, we viewed all of the preliminary data with some skepticism, and then we went through the initial profiles to, to spot uh, holes in the, in, in the stories, uh, to pick out red flags, to identify uh, contradictory information. And then, of course, we, we finally uh, uh, set out to interview people who could address some of those issues, but who had no uh, vested interest in the outcome of our um, evaluations, and that's when it became interesting. Um, intelligence indicated that, that uh, many of these funds did, in fact, uh, have rigorous uh, risk management systems that were well tailored to, to their uh, own cultures and, and their own strategies. Uh, they had strong discipline, clear accountability, uh, an approach that balanced uh, robust risk controls with, a, with an entrepreneurial uh, trading environment. And on the other hand, intelligence also revealed that several of them suffered either from a breakdown in risk management discipline or, or the outright absence of it. Uh, in the case of one fund, we talked to uh, several people who had worked there, and uh, they, had, they described the risk management operation to us as dysfunctional. And that was, that was the word they used. That's not my word. That's the, the word that they used and said that their risk team operated very much in isolation with very little uh, interaction with the uh, uh, portfolio managers there. And, and the reason for, for that isolation was mostly because we were told that the risk management team uh, was viewed as second-class citizens there, and they commanded very little respect. And, uh, and incidentally, that's a scenario that we've seen at uh, some other hedge funds as well. And this, anyway, this, this abnormal work environment that, they, that, that was uh, there also led to a kind of a game of musical chairs with, uh, within the risk management team and, and quite a bit of instability. And uh, so it, it was no surprise that uh, uh, this, this fund subsequently endured heavy losses in 2008, largely due to uh, poor risk management practices, and then had to face uh, you know, billions of dollars in investor redemption requests. Uh, we also learned from intelligence that the risk management operations of two other hedge funds uh, suffered from a lack of dedicated resources and focus. Um, in, in, in each of these cases, the role of the risk management team was poorly defined, uh, and it involved uh, responsibility uh, not just for risk management, for a, but for a number of other unrelated tasks in a way that uh, risk management ultimately got short shrift. Um, both of these funds, uh, again, uh, were unprepared for the uh, 2008 market collapse and uh, ended up getting hammered. Uh, among the other stories that emerged through uh, intelligence on this thing was, was a chief risk officer who had just, just at that time that we were looking into it, walked out on his wife and his family to move in with his mistress, which, which does raise a question of, uh, of whether uh, he would be distracted from his work. Uh, Another well-known well hedge fund that suffered massive losses in 2008, not because it lacked a uh, capable risk management system and team, uh, but because management there, uh, we were told, had decided, ha had actually ignored uh, warnings that were triggered by their own risk controls uh, uh, that should have persuaded them to reallocate assets and reduce risk. Uh, I, I recognize that um, uh, that this, the scope of this project, that as I've described, it was very narrow and that nobody's going to make uh, investment <coughs> decisions based solely on such limited information like that, but, uh, and that wasn't the intent of this project. But I, I think it's fair to say that these data points do um, represent indicators that the hedge funds in questions might perform very well during uh, good times but become uh, quite vulnerable uh, during a market crisis. Uh, in addition, I think this information, you know, it's worth pointing out that this information might not have surfaced during routine due diligence in the absence of intelligence sourced to, again, to third parties who don't have a vested interest in the outcome of the due diligence. And with that in mind, I wanted to uh, just share with you a, a list of uh, a, a few things that I think are critical in conducting due diligence effectively. I, I, I do have well-sourced intelligence that Steve McMenamin likes lists, and so I'm, I'm going to throw this in there for you, Steve. But um, the, the, the first thing, as you probably would expect from what I've said already, is uh, be skeptical. 
Um, we shouldn't accept uh, without substantiation public disclosures or widely held public views, either positive or negative, on a firm or its principles or its practices. Uh, I think the best approach is to develop hypotheses on a continuous basis using the information at hand at the time and then going forward to focus priority attention on, uh, on uh, issues where data points don't fit the hypothesis and then as you continue to collect information on a given issue, adjust those uh, theories accordingly. I think uh, with regard to points of potential concern, red flags, I think it's important not to come to uh, premature uh, conclusions based on, on limited input. Uh, and, and if there are lingering, if there's lingering uncertainty re, uh, involving a significant issue, uh, uh, the thing to do is to keep talking to people and coming at it from different angles until you're confident that you've developed an accurate picture. Um, and, and in my experience, when you get there, you'll know it. So if, if, if you're not sure, you still have work to do. Um, the second thing on, on my list is we, we all need to be uh, students of human behavior. Uh, last year I was uh, asked by the San Diego Police Department to uh, speak to their Criminal Intelligence, Intelligence Division, which focuses mostly on uh, cross-border issues uh, uh, involving uh, the Mexican Mafia and drug lords. And the problem that I was asked to, to address was that the, the Criminal Intelligence Unit traditionally had managed information collection uh, like cops instead of like in intelligence operatives. So they relied on coercion uh, to get sources to cooperate. In other words, uh, you know, adopting an attitude of you either have to cooperate or you're going to face some negative consequence. And, and, but they wanted to develop a more subtle and effective approach with their sources. And one of the things I, I told them, and I think it applies here as well, is that a good interview or, or a, you know, a good interrogation, as the case may be, involves the art of manipulation. And, and that starts with knowing and understanding in advance the person that you're questioning, and including their motives and their biases, and then tailoring those questions to them specifically, uh, keeping in mind that no two interviews should ever be the same. Uh, and I also think that uh, when, when you're interviewing someone, it's good to become adept at focusing uh, not only on the substance of the person's responses, but also on indications of deceptions, deception, that both verbal and nonverbal. Uh, verbal indicators of deception during an interview would include things like uh, a shift in demeanor uh, from, from where, where a person goes from trying to inform you to trying to convince you about something. Uh, another, another indicator would be someone who's uh, caveating their answers with some sort of a qualifiers, like uh, things like last time I checked or, or to the best of my knowledge or not that I know of. Uh, you, uh, those of you who are as old as I am might remember uh, the old movie Stripes. And there's, there's a scene in Stripes where, where uh, Bill Murray is uh, interviewing for a job, and the guy asks him, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And Bill Murray says, convicted? No. Uh, that, that's a verbal indicator. That, that's, that's, that's as good an example as I can give you. Uh, Nonverbal indicators would be uh, things like excessive pauses in uh, answering questions, mover of, moving of uh, anchor points. Uh, the term anchor points is used to refer to parts of your body that are either touching the floor or a chair, for example, so your feet the seat, your, your, your rear end, your elbows on armrest, that type of movement is relevant. Uh, most people think that eye movement back and forth is an indicator. It's not. So uh, uh, anyway, look for, look for that sort of thing. I think uh, some of you may have, I, I know that there are, there's training out there that's available on this sort of thing, and, and any of you who, who have uh, received training in deception detection techniques would also have been instructed that indicators such as the ones that I've described uh, are generally significant only in clusters uh, and not in isolation. So it's important to keep that in mind and uh, not uh, fall into the trap of reading indicators that aren't really there. And then number three, uh, we, we need to be alert and flexible in, in due diligence interviews. I think, I think sometimes there's a tendency to focus uh, in due diligence, uh, to, to focus too much on asking every conceivable question and, uh, tr and trying to cover all the possible ground. And we become, you know, so scripted that we, we, that we, we get focused on issues of, that are really of secondary importance. Uh, I, I think while it's important to be, uh, that due diligence be comprehensive in scope, I think it's also essential that it be efficient and kind of narrowing the focus down to the most significant issues and potential areas of concern. 
And I think an even, even bigger problem is relying too much on a prepared set of questions. I think interviewing preparation is important, but once the set of questions is developed, it really should function only as a guide. Uh, during, during the interview itself, it's critical, critical to, to roll with the punches, uh, to, to observe reactions, to recognize red flags. And I think we have to keep in mind that uh, significant information uh, usually doesn't come from, from a scripted question, but it's often an answer to a follow-up question that was developed on the spot in response to the direction that the interview is going in. And that requires a lot of uh, vigilance and, and an open mind. And then the last thing is be objective. I, I think just as important as understanding the biases of the people we speak with is, is to recognize our own biases and to keep our egos in check. And, and, that, and we have to avoid the common trap of, of subconsciously seeking spe specific outcomes to the due diligence that we're doing, uh, and then cherry-picking the information that leads to that outcome or decision. Um, I, I've worked with a, a handful of portfolio managers o over the years who, who I come to learn really only want to hear uh, the things that fit their own pre preconceived notions, and they, they, discon they discount the intelligence that isn't consistent with, with their own theories, and, and that obviously defeats the whole purpose. So anyway, I think uh, objectivity is something that requires uh, constant practice and, and uh, a lot of self-discipline. Um, that's it for me. Jim, you've just provided some great precepts for carrying out due diligence I wish we had a lot of those we could have included in the best practices that we've white paper were just now being published. But clearly, I think so many investors could have avoided the pain and suffering that they've had in the last couple of years if they had done an adequate job of both investment due diligence and operational due diligence. The white paper that the roundtable is now coming out with is trying to be provide a comprehensive review of all the kinds of questions we should each uh, ask relative to any alternative investment. To ask all those questions is a heavily time-consuming task, but it's not enough. We have to look <coughs> thoughtfully, as Jim was describing, how the questions were answered, because we're investing in particular people, and those particular people count a great deal, and it's all founded on trust. Trust is a sine qua non, and never to be compromised. Um, our only protection is a disciplined painstaking due diligence that helps us to uncover unique skill, but also to confirm integrity. The white paper is the result of a great many people with varied and deep experience, and I feel very privileged to have been able to try to pull those ideas together in one document. Uh, there are questions that are tailored to each kind of hedge fund and each kind of private equity or other kind of illiquid private investment tailored by people who are steeped in experience in that particular specialty. The paper starts with the process of due diligence. And the process of due diligence starts before you ever get to meet a manager. We should be doing a lot of homework in preparation for our meetings with managers, reading everything we can about the manager and by the manager so that when we get in, we are making useful time with the manager. And the benefit of our meetings with the manager and his staff is going to be di directly proportional to the amount of uh, the quality of the advanced preparation that we put into it. The, uh, this kind of, of uh, due diligence is particularly crucial when we're talking about 
private equity or other illiquid investments, we're making, we're committing our money for a great many years. The, the white paper is divided into kind of two parts. One is trying to answer the question of why should we be considering this investment opportunity? And many of us start on uh, looking at a manager because of his great track record, but investing mainly on account of the past performance of a manager is not only inadequate, it's dangerous. Because the past performance of a manager is no more valuable than its predictive value, and that is a judgment. So you've heard the word judgment talked about here tonight, and this is just the beginning of when you're going to hear it here, because predictive value, if you do thorough analysis on some funds, you may find that past performance doesn't have any predictive value. Now, if the fund has been around for a long period of time, run by the same people, making the same uh, decision makers, and have the continuity of the strategy, well, maybe we can attribute some predictive value. But if you go back in the early years when the manager was managing a relatively small amount of money, you have to ask yourself, how much predictive value does that have relative to the amount of money that that manager is managing today? And will the manager stop accepting more money at a point where the additional money doesn't impact the future performance that that manager can deliver. The kinds of questions that you begin looking at when you're talking about track record are, was the track record heavily dependent on one or two really critical fortuitous decisions, or was it a matter of a whole lot of really consistently intelligent decisions? Was it heavily impacted by something, one of a kind uh, occurrence in the market that can't be re expected to be repeated in the future. These are qualitative judgments. Again, the e emphasis being on judgments. And it's so important to be reaching out to the network of our people we know in the field and, and finding out what we can about a particular fund. And as we talk with the people in the fund and the people uh, outside, we will be drawing certain intuitive reactions. And we should pay attention to those intuitive reactions. And based on our experience and knowledge, try and understand why those are the feelings we have and see what... Um, value they have for us. Well, what are the kinds of things we want to do in, uh, in looking at uh, the investment potential of, of a fund? First of all, we ought to know a lot about the asset class, understand the asset class, what kind of um, cyclicality is in it, and where is the asset class, where in that cycle is the asset class now? We really have to understand the strategy. Nobody understood Madoff's strategy. We ought to understand the strategy of the manager, and I'd like to write the strategy in my own words and bounce it back to the manager and say, do I really understand it? I want to know what the edge is that this manager has over others who are um, trying to do the same thing and how sustainable that edge is. How much... Uh, Leverage does the manager take? What are its risks? There are lots of us who became comfortable with certain managers, certain hedge funds, uh, during the middle years of this first decade when their volatility was low and the markets were nice and placid, and then we really were totally amazed when uh, the last two years came along. We weren't prepared for it because we were straight-lining some things that couldn't be straight-lined. The people 
who manage the fund are extremely important. Have we done background checks? You've heard um, our speakers talk about that, how important it is. How much money do the managers invest in their own fund? It should be a meaningful portion of their personal wealth. Um, who are the owners of the fund? Are, they, are the managers owning the fund? And if they're not, how likely are they uh, to stay around for the years ahead when you're going to be <coughs> counting on their uh, doing the job for you? We need to look at the terms of the fund. Are the terms reasonable? Are there side letters with certain investors which give them an advantage over you? If it's a hedge fund, how liquid are the assets in the fund? And how liquid is our investment in the fund? How readily can we redeem? And how do these two things dovetail with one, one another as liquidity in the assets analogous to the liquidity offered to investors? How many investors were hurt last uh, in 2008 when hedge funds sold their most liquid assets to the early redeemers and anyone who was not right up front got stuck with the less liquid assets and had to wait for months and years even to get their money back. One of the reasons for investing in hedge funds is because of the diversification benefit. Uh, the, the free, what's referred to as the free lunch. Trying to get assets that have a low correlation with the stock market, which is really the source of most of the risk for most of our portfolios. But there's a whale of a lot of difference between a fund that rationally has an expectation of a zero correlation with the stock market and one that has a correlation of 0 0.5, 0 0.7 or more. There's a big difference. If it's an illiquid situation you're getting yourself into, uh, how does the manager go about adding value to the a assets he purchases? And what's his exit strategy? Okay, let's say we've gotten to the point where we're really enthusiastic about this manager and, and what he can do for us. Yeah, but we've only started our due diligence process. We have to do due diligence in all the many operational aspects of that manager, any one of which could rise in concern to be sufficient to be a showstopper for us, for, uh, have us go on to look at something else instead. We ought to be reviewing all the documents that are available, not just the offering memorandum or the subscription agreement, but uh, the governing documents of the organization, the audits, the most recent one and prior audits, the reports to the investors over time, written policies uh, and procedures that the manager has. Does he have a compliance manual? Who's in charge of uh, compliance for him? Is there separation of duties? And I'm not just talking about separation between the front office and the, office and the back office. I'm talking about separation among the various kinds of operational functions because it's terribly important for us to be assured of a range of uh, unrelated, competent eyes looking over all aspects of the business. And what kind of continuity is there on the people on the operational side? That's important as well. Who does the pricing? Does the administrator do the pricing or does the uh, manager price some of his own assets? Is, he, is his accounting gap compliant? How does he go about reporting leverage? Are various ways of reporting leverage. We really have to understand how the manager is doing that. Does he do stress testing? Who, who is the risk manager for the uh, fund and what authority does he have? That's, that's, as Jim was pointing out, so critically important. Rusty, does this apply to all strategies? Does this apply to venture, timber, mining? Or is this, we're just talking about hedge funds here. Understanding, 
m most many of the things I'm talking about apply to all of them. <coughs> Uh, the separation of duties is, is important. Doing, reviewing all the, the documents are important. Understanding what kind of leverage and what the role of leverage is in a private illiquid investment is also important. Um, and what kind of counterparty risk do they have, which is greater often with hedge funds and it would be a private, but you still want to ask the question. Um, and what would be a perfect storm for the manager? What could sink the whole program? <clears throat> and transparency is something that we investors have to get comfortable with. Transparency ranges from here to there between different funds. And that we have to be comfortable with what transparency the manager is going to offer. We should also look carefully at the service providers talking about how carefully the manager selects its auditor um, and its consultants, risk consultants or legal counsel. And if it's a hedge fund, you want to know about the prime broker and custodian and the administrator. They should all be very first class. Many hedge funds <clears throat> help try to help their prospective investors by doing DDQs, the due diligence questionnaires. And I would love to see this white paper picked up by uh, uh, hedge fund managers and using this as the source of all the questions they should put in their DDQs. But it wouldn't relieve the, us investors for our, our due diligence <coughs> because we need to understand the depth of the answers that they provide. And as we talk with the members of the management team, we need to do it with cat's whiskers. Many years ago, I met a CEO who was asked the question, what's the single most characteristic he was looking for in a prospective member of senior management? His answer was cat's whiskers. We need to have that sensitivity and use that as we are talking with the people in the, uh, on the manager and with others outside. Because investing in, especially in alternative assets, is an art. It's an interactive process where we're trying to triangulate information from multiple sources. Um, There's no surefire way of saying this due diligence process, no matter how thorough it is, is going to work. But because it's all based on judgments. But if our judgments are honed by a really thorough job of due diligence, both on the investment and operational side, can help us avoid mistakes and identify opportunities with su superior um, superior opportunities going forward. Well, let's say we have identified something and it holds up after our operational uh, due diligence and we also decide that it fits appropriately in our particular portfolio. Just because it's great doesn't mean that it's something that we should be adding to But let's say we have done it and we have committed to it. That's only the beginning too because each year, especially in a hedge fund, if we haven't redeemed from that hedge fund, we have recommitted to it. And that should be a decision, a conscious decision made on a continuing due diligence that builds on what we did at the very beginning. Well, the white paper, where well, we tried to make it as complete as it can be and comprehensive, is and will always be a work in progress. But I think it provides a living, working document that will help us as we consider investment opportunities as we ask the question, have I really done 
my due diligence well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rusty. I think we should uh, we should open this up to questions. I'm sure there are lots of them. Um, so, please. give you an answer that may be um, surprising given who it's coming from I think you you have to have some some um, order of priority in terms of your fiduciary responsibilities you can't be all things to all people you saw the difficulty in the recent congressional testimony that certain people from certain financial institutions had answering the simple question of who do you who is your duty of obligation to your firm your shareholders your clients and so on I would probably want to know more about the facts so I'm semi ducking your question I think for some for some firms for some individuals you would conclude uh, I'm I'm the fiduciary for this client, I'm the fiduciary for this pension fund, whoever it is that you're an investor. And my job, uh, the pact that I signed in effect was to protect the investment that they had put in my hands and made me responsible for. My instinct is that's probably your first obligation. Um, I don't know where you go with the second, third, fourth obligations, but I've always felt when I built businesses, when I took somebody else's money as an investor, or as a shareholder, as a borrower, that was my first obligation. I think legitimate people could answer your question with different answers. Okay, well, I guess I'll start, and I'll say that, first of all, I think it's um, intuition is a big part of it. I think, I think that it has to be part of it, and I think intuition is something that comes with experience. The more experience you have, the more you can uh, gain confidence that your intuition is correct, that you have something to base it on. 
And, and I, I mentioned it in one part that, that I think that any time you're looking at something like that where, where concerns start to come up but you're not really sure what direction it's going in, what, what direction the story is going in, I think that that's when intuition you know, plays a big role because it's at that point I think where you start to postulate, you start to come up with scenarios that you think fit the facts that you have. And I think that that takes a lot of intuition to, to start doing that, to hypothesize. You have to do that uh, along with taking the information into account. But then I think that the second part of that is then that you have to verify that intuition. I think, I think, I think it's a very interactive process. It's iterative where you go back and forth. You, you, you uh, use that intuition. You hypothesize. You come up with a story that you think fits the facts that you have using that intuition. And then you go out and seek additional information that either, uh, that either confirms or refutes different aspects of it and then you continue to adjust and I think you you keep doing that process until you say I got it I have a feel for this and, and like I said I think in, in my experience inevitably you know when you're there you say I got this now I know the story I know who this guy is or I know who this company is I, I I feel it I don't I don't need to ask any more questions and I think until then you're always using that interact uh, intuition and playing it off with the fact gathering to either confirm or refute it so, um, to answer your question, uh, every reporter is different, but um, in my case, uh, in my early years, I used a tape recorder um, because it just let me focus on the person, um, and then I would go back later and transcribe the interview, um, which was great because actually, you know, I would catch things that I missed the first time around. Um, I don't think I don't know if a lot of hedge fund managers would would allow you to do that, but can certainly ask. Um, uh, and then secondly, um, sometimes I think like what Jim said, it's more important what people don't say um, than sometimes what they say. Um, when I worked at the um, startup fund, which is called Vision Capital, it's still around. I don't know how, um, but um, they. Um, they had a very aggressive uh, marking policy on their portfolio. Um, you know, they were marking warrants on their portfolios um, uh, much more aggressively than other hedge funds in the same category. Um, and for some reason, um, you know, investors would ask this question about, because I, I would often sit in on these investor meetings and they would ask questions about, you know, how you mark the portfolio and so forth. And nobody ever challenged the manager to justify, why do you do this? Like, why do you mark it this way when other funds mark it that way? I was always stunned. Um, I was always waiting for that question. And um, that was actually part of the reason why I left, because I felt like the policies were not ethical towards the investors. Um, and then I was just thinking um, about that. What other that other gentleman said about what do you do when you know someone's a bad person? I don't know that that makes them a bad investment. I mean, um, maybe I'm maybe I live on the edge here. Um, but uh, you know, for instance, here's another example. Um, at the same hedge fund, we were looking at a, uh, investing in a company where the CEO had served time in prison, which I found out. And um, it turned out that he had a DUI and had killed someone in a drunk driving accident, but had paid his debt to society and was back in the securities industry and was running a public company. So I informed the portfolio manager of all the data I came up with and I said, you know, look, is he a bad person? That's a judgment, like Jewel said. Um, and they ended up investing, and it made money for them. Um, and I learned something from that because it made me realize that may not prevent someone from making, you know, putting their money on the line. Um, anyway, hope that answered your question. You, you know what? Listen, listen to the different ways in which these questions are getting answered. And of course, people have revealed to you their their backgrounds. Um, Jim forgot to mention 
that he originally was raised, uh, raised in Russia and was uh, a sleeper for many years. Uh, and is, re is part of a recent exchange program at Al Jazeera. <laughs> LeBron just got topped again tonight. But listen, listen to the different ways you answered the question and make your judgments. Make your judgments as you're going through this. I mean, you listen to Russell. Uh, you, you think you'd spend half your goddamn life uh, as a fund of funds manager interviewing one hedge fund manager because the list starts here and ends there. So you're listening and wondering, how the hell am I going to get through all this stuff? Uh, you listen to Jim, who's obviously deeply experienced, you know, in the real world. You listen to Jim, deeply experienced. I mean, you don't have to listen to very long that you know. You certainly don't want to be any other end of those questions. Uh, because he comes across, he comes across uh, in a certain way, uh, less manipulative, more scary. Frankly, uh, you listen, you listen to Erin, who's kind of here and there, and she's she she looks she, she it's almost like a G. R. Shucks, almost semi ditzy, but you know she's very smart, not because she wrote the book. Uh, but because of where she's getting to. Uh, one of the things I think is really important is the teams that you have, make sure the teams are mixed. You don't want groupthink. You don't want three white guys who went to, went to Wharton and they're all 32 years old. You know what? They think the same crap. Um, have a little diversity, not because it's part of a uh, civil rights program, but because you want different players that you can put onto the field depending on who it is you're looking at. As much as possible, try to have a woman in the mix. They're different. They think differently. They have a, diff they have a different sense of smell. They're less threatening. Unless you got somebody who you need to put up against the wall and you wheel Jim in. <laughs> uh, so it isn't, always, it isn't always the same kind of character. You've got to You've got to match a little bit what Russell was saying in part of his, uh, his laundry list of things to do. Match your players to the situation. If you've got a group that you really have bad vibes about, talking about Jim's point about intuition, you don't send the same group of Cub Scouts in that you're going to send down to somebody else who you have different feelings about. So you've got to do a little bit of mixing and matching, which I think is... Who you put on the team, whether it's a one person, and, and don't just send one person, because you can't you can't do everything. It's really hard. You've got to be incredibly skilled. You want a minimum of you want a minimum of two of two people, and keep mixing your teams up if you have enough personnel. Sorry, Steve. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat> Thank you. A um, couple of housekeeping items. Erin has promised us she would sign her book out in the uh, dais, and so take advantage. Um, what, do you, what do you mean, take advantage? <laughs> 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 and, and is the woman here to sell books? I mean, we need some transparency. <laughs> Erin, what's, what's going on? They are, they are on the house. <laughs> and... Um, Thanks to Steve, and uh, I'm happy to sign them. And um, by the way, my email address is in the book, so you can email me anonymously. Aaron's book is probably the most authentic, well-researched book on the Madoff crisis that I've ever seen. It's incredibly detailed. She did a lot of research, and, and I wholeheartedly endorse it. I recommend you all read it. But Aaron will sign it, but you should read it. Afterwards, um, a couple of things. You know, we're, we're talking about. Jules is saying create diversity. You know, the, the, and Rusty talked about this. There is no protection. Our only protection is due diligence. There is no regulation that's going to keep us from betting on someone. Um, you know, David Stores and I and. Ray Daly, we were with uh, Bernanke a couple of years ago after best practices, and we sat there. Uh, you do this all the time, you go down there and meet with these people. But we sat with Bernanke, and uh, Bernanke says, Should we regulate this industry? And, uh, 
we said, well, we don't think you need to because investors performing their due diligence are the clearing mechanism for the marketplace. So it's your doing this due diligence that keeps everyone honest and keeps the regulators from really fumbling it and, and, and imposing some kind of draconian rule on this whole process. So everything that Rusty talked about, it's boring. It's hard work, and there's no substitute for it. Something that Ted Seides brings up is the, the notion of the small rooms. This is a small room. There's no one here. Everyone's over at LeBron James, and it's a boring session. <laughs> but this is this is where the real meat is. This is where you make money, and this is where you avoid disaster. And, you know, I'm, I'm really encouraged by what we heard here on the dais tonight. This did not come out in our discovery process, which you which you all talked about tonight. But it's it's very very meaningful and very helpful. Um, and with that, I'd like to honor the people that. Um, that contributed to this white paper. You know, running a not-for-profit not is one of the hardest things I've ever done. It, you know, I don't get paid for this. It's really very, very distracting. It's an incredible 990 experience. And, but the mo one of the most profound things, one of the most gratifying things about doing this is the, are the people who, who volunteer their time and volunteer their work and volunteer their, their blood, sweat, and tears and, and and write this stuff. It's hard. It's very hard. And that's why I'm, I'm still in it. And I'd like to honor the people that actually wrote this report. And if you would, I'd like to embarrass you right now. Please stand up when I call your name. But Bob Aaron, would you please stand up? <laughs> ben Alamance, I don't need to stand. Please stand. You, you need to stand. You're up front. Frank Gustin, who wrote the original draft. Jennifer Keeney, are you here? You're not here. So you don't have to stand up. Jeff Kelly, please stand up. I know you're here. And Rusty Olson, who literally wrote the whole thing, all 200 pages, boiled down to 76 pages. Can we please give these fine people a hand? Thank you for your service, and thank you for raising the bar. And by the way, Jules, would you stand up too? You contributed as well. <laughs> so, um, just two two small things I'll leave you with. Never fall in love. <laughs> and the bar is still open. <laughs> Aaron, Jim, Rusty, and Jules, good job. Thank, Thank you, you so much.